This is your final exam podcast review. I had another quiz for you that Blackboard destroyed. Some of you wrote me about it and told me that it's still the six to eight quiz is the last one up there. And I apologize for that, kind of. You did um, not have to do an extra quiz, but Blackboard completely deleted a quiz that I created. And by the time I discovered that or realized that, it really is kind of too late for you to do another quiz and the final exam. So here's your final exam review. You got out of one quiz by luck, by the grace of Blackboard. The main thing that you have to know on this exam is verb conjugation. Verb conjugation that you have so far is you know that there is the first conjugation verbs and second conjugation verbs. You've seen third conjugation verbs a little bit. You need to be able to identify them by their principal parts. First conjugation verbs are identifiable because the second principal part ends in A-R-E. Second conjugation verbs are identifiable because they end in E-R-E. And the first principal part is E-O. I could point out to you that second conjugation verbs also have a long E-R-E, but you won't see that in advanced Latin text, original manuscripts, or ancient Roman inscriptions. So in real Latin text that you would read as a scholar or as a, a archaeologist, do not make long marks. That's kind of a crutch that a lot of elementary texts use, but I think it's kind of misleading because it won't help you in the long term. And third, conjugation verbs have an E-R-E -E as well in the second principal part, but they only have an O in the first one. So second has E-O versus O, both of them have E-R-E. -E. And again, I could point out to you that this is a short E-R-E, -E, and that would be useful for you in your current text, but not for the long term. So there are three different types for you to know in general. The tenses that you've learned so far are the indicative present active. In the indicative present active, you take the second principal part. You're mostly dealing with first and second conjugation verbs. You've just barely seen the third conjugation so far in this text. So you take the second principal part and you drop the RE for these. That won't always be the case when you get into third, third I, and fourth conjugation verbs. But for now, for first and second conjugation, you drop the RE. Then you add the endings. Primary active personal suffixes is what you would call these. And there's one alternation made for ama. When two vowels come together, the first one tends to be swallowed up by the second one. You'll note that through the rest of this verb conjugation, two vowels do not meet. But when two vowels are next to each other, they tend to swallow the pronunciation of the first one, and it's over time, it's lost and is not spelled like that anymore or pronounced like that anymore. So you lose the A in all the first conjugation verbs. Here, however, here's an exception. The long E remains firm with the O, and it is not swallowed up, and then the rest of the word conjugates normally. Moneo, mones, monet, monemos, monetis, monent. There's your indicative present active. I think most of you have a good feel for that. Next tense that you learned is the indicative imperfect active. Similar process, you take the second principal part, you drop the RE, you add the sign of the imperfect, and then instead of adding an O for the first person singular, you add an S, sorry, an M. And then the rest of it is the same endings as the present. Here's the stem or the theme. Drop the RE, whether it's a first or a second conjugation, you drop the RE, add the BA, and then add 
the primary act of personal suffix is this time with an M. Sometimes it's an M for the first person singular, sometimes it's an O. For the present, it's always an O. For the imperfect, it's always an M. The next tense that you learned was the indicative future active. Same process. Take the second principal part, drop the RE, add the sign of the future, which is a BI, and then add the O variety of the primary act of personal suffixes. For the future, the first person singular is always an O. Now the same thing happens here as happened in the indicative present active. The I, two vowels coming together, the first one tends to disappear. So it becomes amabo, not amabio. Same thing with mona bio. Two vowels don't generally survive in that close of proximity. Otherwise, though, the bi is stable and remains throughout, although there is another exception in the third person plural. It's not amabint but amabunt. That is always the case, whether it's first or second conjugation. The bi changes into a bu. So the only exceptions to the process, as I outline it so far, are that the e is stable in second conjugation verbs. The m is the first person ending for the imperfect. The I, as you would expect, disappears in the future for the first person singular, and the U always appears in the third person plural. The present, the imperfect, and the future all use the second principal part. You've also seen the indicative perfect active. In those verbs, you take the third principal part and drop the I whether it's a first or second conjugation, you take the third principal part and drop the I, and then you add the perfect system, active personal suffixes, which are E, Easty, Eat, Emus, Istus, and Arunt, or Aira. Remember that your book only tests you on Arunt, and that's what you can expect on the final exam. But for the second semester, you will be responsible for the A runt and the ERA. It's no different for monoe, monoisti, monoit, monoemus, monoistus, mono A runt, or mono ERA. That's the indicative perfect active with the third principal part. The other tense that you've learned that uses the third principal part is the indicative. Pluperfect active. The pluperfect uses the third principal part as well, except you add Aram, Eras, Erat, Eramus, Eratus, and Erant to the ending. Both of these tenses use the third principal part, whereas the imperfect future and present use the second principal part. The translation of these different tenses. The indicative present active, which you might just think of as the present, is translated as amo, amas, for example, I love or you love. Depending on how the sentence is constructed, you may choose to say I am loving or you are loving. You should have a sense for both possibilities because sometimes one just doesn't sound good when you're translating.
I love or I am loving, you love or you are loving. Those are your two options for the present. For the indicative imperfect active, which your book probably refers to simply as the imperfect, you're going to translate that as um, uh, bomb would be translated as I used to love or I was loving or you used to love or you were loving. Again, you're going to find sentences in which it sounds awkward and ridiculous to translate I used to love. It'll sound much better if you said I was loving. You used to love. You were loving. He, she, or it used to love. He, she, or it was loving. That's your imperfect. Your indicative future active or future tense is translated as I will love. I suppose you could translate that, that as I will be loving, but it's a little bit excessive. I know I realize that uh, handwriting today is particularly sloppy. I hope it isn't always that sloppy. No one has written me or phoned me or Skyped me to tell me that it was illegible or unreadable, and you ought to do that if it is. If you can't read it, it is no good to you. I don't have the greatest stylus. I don't think it gives me the greatest control on my writing, so if you have a complaint about it, I will absolutely take that seriously and try to do something about it. The indicative perfect active, what the textbook probably refers to simply as the perfect tense, would be translated in, again, two ways. Amawi would be, I have loved, and when that sounds awkward, you can just write, I loved. That distinguishes it from the imperfect, which is, I used to love, or I was loving. And then the indicative pluperfect, or the pluperfect, is translated as, I had loved. There's not another option for that one. You had loved, he, she, or it had loved. To me, the verbs are the most important part of the sentence. I mentioned that from the very first screencast. You have to be able to identify the verb and start with the verb. The verb is the Latin word for word. Verbum means word. If you start there, then you can figure out what the subject is, whether it's singular or plural. If you start there, you can have a one-word sentence consisting of just a verb. You can't have a one-word sentence consisting just of a noun or an adjective. A verb can be its own sentence, and the verb is the most important word. That's the biggest emphasis in most ways on this exam. And you only know so far the present, the imperfect, the future, the perfect, and the pluperfect. All in the active voice, all in the indicative. In addition to that, you know a couple of other moods outside of the indicative. You have to be aware that you know the infinitive present active. I would abbreviate this as INFPA. Please, again, contact me if you are not following my abbreviations. I'm very consistent with them. It has worked for 15 years of my Latin teaching. It doesn't necessarily mean it works for you. So just contact me and let me know what isn't working for you. The class is designed for you. I don't have an agenda except for you to do well in the class. The infinitive present active is easy to understand. It is simply the second principal part. You do nothing to it, and it translates as to love. You take the second principal part, you do nothing to it whatsoever, and it translates as to warn. To eat, to run, to see. Second principal part, the second thing in the dictionary, and that's the infinitive present active. The other mood that you've been exposed to is the imperative present active. 
imperative present active, which I would abbreviate as IMP, PA. For that one, you take the second principal part, drop the RE, whether it's first or second conjugation. We have not gotten to the third, third I, or fourth conjugation in this class, so don't worry about them now. There are some differences. Just previewing it so you're prepared for that when the day comes. For the imperative present active, it only comes in the second person singular and the second person plural. You and you. You and you all. You take the second person part, drop the RE, and add nothing for the second person singular. And then you translate that often with an exclamation point to make your point that it is a command as love or warn. Hey you, warn everyone. It's a command to people. For the second person plural, you take the second principal part, drop the RE, and then add TE. And again, it's really difficult to distinguish them in English. You would just translate it as love. Hey y'all, love. I command you. And the same thing right here. You drop the RE, add TE, and it translates as warn, usually with an exclamation point to emphasize that it is a command. That's the imperative present active. It's for commands. The imperative is the command mood. The infinitive is a verb that is, has become a noun. For example, you can say to love is a wonderful thing. I've just called love a thing because the infinitive makes a verb into a noun and the indicative, these are the three moods you know so far, are for assertions about reality. They're not statements of fact, as your book claims. They're assertions about reality. For example, an opinion is an assertion about reality. I think it's hot in here. I would say that in the indicative mood. Or I could lie in the indicative mood. I was at a restaurant last night. I would say that in the indicative mood, even though it's not a statement of fact. It's an assertion. It's a claim about reality. Sometimes those assertions will be true and statements of fact, but not always. Grammar, which is your big topic in this class, consists of two branches. Morphology, which is what I just showed you with the verbs. Morphology consists of conjugation, which is what you do to verbs. You change their form, and it consists of declension, which is what you do to nouns and adjectives. You change their form. So the test consists of a lot of conjugation, uh, some degree of declension, just about as much uh, as the conjugation, but conjugation is much more important, as I pointed out. And then you've started to learn just a little bit of the other main branch of grammar, which is syntax. That's the way in which you arrange the words. It's not just the word order, per se, because you know that the Latin word order doesn't matter that much. You know very little syntax so far, but I'll remind you of the very little that you do know after we talk about the declensions. The declensions that you know so far are simple. You know the first declension, which looks like this in the dictionary, and then you just have to add those endings. You drop the AE from the genitive form, the second thing in the dictionary, and then you just add the endings to that stem. So for example, you'd add an A to that stem. You'd add back the A-E to the P-U-E-L-L. -L. You'd add the A-E again. You'd add the A-M, a long A. I'm gonna skip the vocative. A-E for the nominative plural. Aram, is. Os and is. There's your first declension ending. So you take the second thing in the dictionary. Trust me on this. I know it might seem redundant. 
or unnecessary to go to the second thing. But if you learn one way to do everything, it's much easier in the long term because you're going to learn third conjugation, fourth conjugation, and fifth conjugation. You already know third conjuga conjugation to some extent. If you learn one way to do things, it's much easier than a variety of different ways. Take the second thing in the dictionary, you drop the AE for the first declension, and then you add these endings. Nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, and ablative singular, and then nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, and ablative plural. First conjugation is easy. Next conjugation that you learned is the second conjugation, but there are many varieties of second conjugation. You have the most simple one, which looks like this, amicus, amici in the dictionary. You take the second thing in the dictionary, you drop off the I in this case, and then you add the various endings, US, I, O, um, O, plural, E, orum, is, os, is. You can see a lot of correspondences between those forms. The second variety looks like this, puer. Puer does not have the U.S. ending. It adds nothing on to the first form, the nominative singular. Then it adds the I, the O, the um, the O, the E, the or, and the E's, the O's, and the E's. There's a third variety. It looks like this. Agar. Agri. Note that it loses the E in the genitive. That's why I tell you, you start with the second thing in the dictionary, because this form is the one that is used as the stem, minus the I, for all the rest of the forms. So... Ager keeps its E, and then you add nothing to the end, just like puer. They're very similar in the nominative singular. But then Ager loses the E for the rest of the declension. And then you just follow this rest of the declension, add the regular old endings, etc., 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 but you use the second thing in the dictionary as your base to get your basic stem for the nouns. Second declension has one more form, the neuter. The neuter, like the word templum, does not have the U.S. It does not have nothing in the nominative. It ends with U-M instead of U-S. But the process is the same. You take the second thing in the dictionary, which is going to be templi, drop off the I from that, and there's your stem. T-E-M-P-L. T-E-M-P-L is repeated all the way through. And then you add their endings. Very, very similar to the masculine or feminine second declensions. In the plural, it also has another change, though. The nominative plural is templa. Just like bacterium in English becomes bacteria, or a piece of datum becomes data, templum becomes templa. And then it goes back to normal, just like a regular second declension, temporum, templis. But all neuters have the same form for the nominative and accusative. Singular, templum. Sim singular, accusative, templum. Plural, nominative, templa. Plural, accusative, templa. And then templis. Those are all the forms you have to worry about for the first and second declension. Nouns. There is, however, the adjectives of the first and second declension, what I call two, one, two adjectives. They look like this, bonus, which looks like the last version of amicus and is declined in exactly the same way, and then bona, 
which looks exactly like Puella from the first declension, and then Bonam, which looks exactly like Templum. Bonas, Bona, Bonam is your basic, normal, easy variety of 212 adjective. There is, in addition to that, another variety of this kind of adjective. It's still a 212. But note that the first form, instead of having the U.S. second declension masculine form, has more like the puer form. In fact, it's exactly like the puer form. Better to describe it, in fact, as like the ager form, because look, it loses the e in all subsequent forms. So that's important to note that you take, again, the second thing in the dictionary to find your stem for the remainder of the adjective's declension. All the forms except for the nominative singular masculine, even the genitive singular masculine, and the dative singular masculine, lose the E. You use the second thing in the dictionary as your base, and you'll never be wrong. It's not always necessary, obviously, but if you stick with one consistent pattern, you'll never forget. It'll be easier to remember how to do these things. Again, polker is a second declension masculine, declines just like ager. Polkra is a first declension feminine, and it declines just like puella. Take this uh, genitive form, drop off the ae, and you've got it. And polkrum is a second declension neuter, just like templum. No difficulties in these adjectives. They're just repeats of the patterns for noun declensions. These are called 212 adjectives, a second declension masculine, a first declension feminine, and a second declension neuter is the pattern in which they will always appear in the dictionary. You also learn the third declension. Eventually, you will learn there is a form of third declension adjective, in fact, a number of different forms of third declension adjective, but for now, you just know pretty basic third declension nouns. You know rex, regus, that's one type. Again, here's the point. If you start with the second thing in the dictionary, you will never get it wrong. You take the second thing in the dictionary, for example, rex regus, drop off the is, and you've got the stem for the remainder of the forms. The nominative singular is not reliable. Note that the endings are very different from the first and second declension. But they still have some things in common with it. There's your regular, plain old, third declension noun. Now there are also the so-called I stem third conjugations. There is a slight variation in some of these nouns. I'll explain why after you see the form. It's a very minor difference. You take the second thing in the dictionary, sen, drop off the is, and then you add the rest of the forms. Seni, senum. So far, no difference here. Here's your sole difference. You have an I in the genitive plural. And it's a very minor difference, just one little I right there. But you have to know the difference between these two forms. You can tell these third I apart from the regular third because they either have the same amount of syllables in the nominative singular and genitive singular. That's why you need this as your dictionary lexical entry. You need two forms, not just one, like it would be in an English dictionary. Or because they have two consonants 
before the is in the genitive. Again, it's the genitive or the second thing in the dictionary that's important. RT before the is means that this is an I stem, whereas regus only has a G before the is. Senex and partis are I stems. They add an I in the genitive plural only. As for your syntax, there's very little that you learned. The main thing that you learned in the syntax so far is this video form. The verb video is going to be followed by an accusative subject. Normally the accusative is in the nominative, but after the verb video, the subject is in the accusative and the uh, sorry, the verb is going to be in the infinitive. It's a strange construction. You do sort of do it in English, as I explained in an earlier screencast, but it is difficult to wrap your mind around it when you're doing it in a foreign language. This sentence, for example, says, I see that, and there's no that in Latin. You don't really need it in English either, but it sounds a little smoother to my ear. I see that the girl lives. Even though this technically should be translated as to live, that would sound ridiculous in English. I see the girl, sorry, I put plural. I see that the girl to live makes no sense in English. So you translate it like you would good English, not very literally from the Latin. I see that the girl lives as if this infinitive, present active, were really an indicative present active. You have to make that shift in your mind. It's actually an infinitive, but you have to translate it as if it were an indicative. Here's a more complex example, but it's the same pattern. After you say, I see, or we see, or you see, or he, she, or it sees, they see, doesn't matter the person and number of the video, you have the accusative subject, I see that the boy, even though it's accusative, you treat it as if it were the noun, not to love, even though this is infinitive, I see that the boy loves the girl. Now this is more complex because this is also in the accusative. How do you know which of these two accusatives, boy and girl, is actually the quote-unquote subject of this clause? The one that comes first is the subject. That's the only way to keep them straight. It's a very simple rule to remember. The one that comes first is the thing doing the action. Very simple, it's just as in English, so it's not difficult to remember. I see that the boy loves the girl. You could never mistake that for I see that the girl loves the boy because it's not in the proper word order. Word order doesn't matter that much in Latin, but this is one specific instance where word order matters completely. Another example, you could say we see that the man is present. There's the infinitive, present active. I'm going to translate it as if it were an indicative. Here's the accusative subject, and here's the verb see, which sets into motion this strange syntax of the second clause. This is the main clause, we see. It's a complete sentence in and of itself. And once you say, we see, in the main clause, you get this strange syntax in the subordinate clause where accusatives become subjects and infinitives are translated into English as indicatives. I see that the man is present. Not, I see the man to be present. Just doesn't sound like English. Related to that, is the syntax of the verb, the imperative, nola, that's the second person singular, and nolita, that's the second person plural. These are both imperative commands, present tense, active voice. Nola also is followed by, nola and nolita, are also followed by an infinitive. So if you would say, Nolita amare, you'd be talking to 
you all, you plural, it would say, do not love. It would sound silly to say, do not to love, even though this is the infinitive present active again. You're going to translate it more as if it were an indicative again. Hey, y'all, don't love. If it were singular, it would be the same pattern. It would say, nola amare. Hey, you, don't love. Very simple syntax. Nola, for any verb, nola tendo. Sorry, nola tendera. Don't stretch out. I don't know why you would ever say that to anyone, but I'm just trying to find random examples. Or the plural, nolita serware. Don't serve. In both cases, this verb is in the infinitive present active, the second thing in the dictionary. And it's not translated like that into English. Do not stretch, do not serve, do not love, do not love. That's the syntax of NOLA. Those are the main points that you have learned this semester and that I've focused on on the final exam. If you are behind or if you feel uncomfortable with any of the uh, lessons, I would recommend you watch any of the screencasts again or watch the screencast while you're in the middle of taking that exam. I set that exam up so you can take it twice and take the average of the two scores that you learn from doing it the second time. Take as long as you need to do that exam. I've also added to this exam a little final project, as I put in the syllabus in the very beginning of the year and announced in the announcements. The final project is simply that you translate the latest story in the textbook and then retell it in your own words. So if the story um, has you know, as it often is, is kind of awkwardly written. You know, you have a story like, uh, I'm reading from chapter uh, 4 right now, page 27, but Arachne did not have wisdom. Mer Mer Minerva did not, uh, sorry, she denied that Minerva was her teacher. The uh, rash girl praises herself and exclaims, uh, I make pictures and better stories than Minerva. Now, that's all very awkward, and it sounds like a really poorly written children's book. I want you to re retell that story, not at great length, but in good English. You can tell it like a children's story, but the textbook wording is very awkward, so I just want you to go through a simple exercise of translating the last chapter that we've done. Um, sorry, the chapter that you haven't done yet as it's noted on the exam. I want you to go through an exercise of translating that chapter and then rewriting it in a little bit better English. That's all. It's not rewriting the whole story, not making a masterpiece, don't spend hours doing it. Just tell it a little bit more nicely than it sounds in your translation. And that's it. The exam should be easy. It might take a little bit of time, especially if you do it twice, but you'll learn something.